I'll come back to Courtney's presentation of the randomized phase two of anacitinib and AZA. I, I want to, um, the azacitidine arm probably looked good because 20% of those patients got anacitinib, but that's the only data she had. I wonder how many of those patients actually got venetoclax combinations and, and did well. Uh, so your point's well taken, Amir, that, you know, I'm not saying that the survival of patients who get AZA alone is going to be 22 months. I, I'm saying that we now have choices for these patients and we can add these therapies in. But I think it's worth it to note that we're probably never going to really know the answer to that study for the exact reason that the choices evolved as those studies were trying to accrue. So, I mean, it becomes really, really difficult. You have to go outside of the U.S. to complete the accrual because there was contamination, complete contamination with venetoclax. I think it's just been, I think that um, those companies have had a very tough time um, accruing and have definitely broadened the, um, the net with respect to participating uh, trial centers. Amir, I want to come back to you. Uh, you, you published in uh, JAM Oncology the anacitinib experience with differentiation syndrome. Do you want to uh, talk about uh, IDHDS? Thank you, Harry. You know, I think, um, so we published about 14, 15% of patients who received anacitinib monotherapy on the original uh, phase one dose expansion and uh, dose escalation and dose expansion study. Um, and uh, so differentiation syndrome in, in that setting uh, mainly manifested as a vague constellation of symptoms and signs. Unexplained fever, respiratory symptoms, pleural effusions, pericardial effusions, rash, mild, generally azotemia, um, bony pains, adenopathy, um, and we tried to go through every single case um, that had that constellation. And as you can imagine, in a patient who has AML with narrow suppressed, who has potential cardiac pulmonary uh, symptoms, it's difficult to tease out what's what. But in our um, looking through this, and, I, and we looked through it uh, with um, Eitan Stein, Courtney DiNardo, and um, Stefan de Paton, uh, we came across approximately 15% uh, or so of patients who we could not, who we could easily or uh, fairly well rule out other secondary causes of those symptoms and signs and could say that the likelihood of differentiation syndrome was possibly or likely related um, to the actual process of the, meaning the differentiation syndrome uh, was caused by the drug. It wasn't, there wasn't a secondary cause for those symptoms, that it was related to differentiation syndrome. Differentiation syndrome can be severe. It can be potentially life-threatening. Um, so our recommendation has generally been that if you suspect it and worry about it and secondary causes cannot be immediately and quickly ruled out, that you should start treatment with dexamethasone and we recommend 10 milligrams twice a day. And then once and if patients get better and they should if it is differentiation syndrome, then there should be a tapering down of uh, dose over time. On occasion, differentiation syndrome is accompanied by, not necessarily so, but on occasion it is accompanied by uh, leukocytosis. So hydroxyurea may be necessary if there is concurrent leukocytosis. Similarly, other phenomena can be a co-occurrent, such as uh, DIC, which can be potentially life-threatening, uh, as well as uh, tumor lysis syndrome. So again, it is hard to necessarily tease out differentiation syndrome in, a, in AML patients, but when secondary uh, causes are ruled out or cannot be ruled out in a uh, timely manner. I think initiation of steroids is important because these conditions can escalate. And if you look at study after study after study with, the, with IDH inhibitors, either as monotherapy or in combination with induction or HMA, you'll see this rate of approximately 12 to 20 percent of patients getting differentiation syndrome. So it is a real entity and it needs to be looked at uh, closely in patients who are getting treatment. Uh, one other important point I would just say is that the timing of developing differentiation syndrome can be somewhat delayed as opposed to the differentiation syndrome that you would get with ATRA. Uh, the differentiation syndrome with IDH inhibitors, typically we found that the median time of onset was around four weeks. So anywhere between 10 days to six months, you can potentially get it, especially if you stop treatment and resume it later, you can get recurrent episodes of differentiation syndrome. Yeah. I agree, um, uh, Amir, and you know a couple other important distinctions be, uh, between IDH and APL differentiation syndrome is 100% of patients with APL who develop differentiation syndrome, if they survive, will achieve a remission. That is not true with the IDH inhibitors, partly because I think some of these patients really truly had progression and, and pneumonia and heart failure and things like that, but also it may be that you're differentiating one clone but then a FLT3 positive clone grows out 
Um, and, and so you yeah. may see some differentiation. I completely uh, agree with Harry on this one. APL is about the cleanest disease that we treat, right? Generally, it's only one alteration that causes a disease. On occasion, you'll get a FLIP3 mutation. But with IDH mutations, you get the ugly AMLs, the, you know, the multiple clones, the other mutations. You might uh, have a potential efficacy uh, treating the IDH uh, susceptible a clone with an IDH inhibitor. That might be why not everybody with, uh, with uh, treated with IDH inhibitors gets a differentiation syndrome. And certainly not uh, probably part of the reason why Patients don't respond. Some patients don't respond to IDH inhibitors. Um, but also keep in mind that about 100% of patients treated with atral arsenic these days also get remission anyway. So it's, it's, uh, we're kind of comparing uh, something that is good with something that is outstanding. So it's a little bit uh, challenging and not perhaps the fairest comparison for poor IDH inhibitors. Harry, I wanted to jump in with one um, comment that you know, AML used to be um, an inpatient disease, right? And now there are lots of aspects of AML therapy that are being handled as an outpatient. And one of the things that we've actually worked on um, with the companies um, uh, surrounding differentiation syndrome is I think a little bit of patient education and advocacy so that they understand also this toxicity. Now you have an APL patient coming into the hospital, you're not necessarily giving them a lecture on differentiation um, therapy if you're watching them in the hospital. If they get it, you'll tell them about it. If they don't, they don't. But a lot of these patients, we were thinking as we were trying to prepare some of the educational materials for patients, they might end up in a local emergency room where somebody has never heard of the medication that they're on. They don't know what to look for. And I think that there actually has been an explosion of articles for um, internal medicine doctors, for emergency room physicians on various oncologic complications of therapy, both for solid tumor therapies and also increasingly for heme malignancies to just alert doctors that if you have somebody coming in with leukocytosis and infiltrates, it may not be pneumonia. You might have differentiation. So I just think it was a whole other axis of this particular toxicity to um, um, kind of warn the public, if you will, warn the patients, warn so that people were not getting um, really down the wrong path as they presented to the emergency room. Yeah, early intervention with dexamethasone 10 milligrams twice daily is very important, admitting them for monitoring. Um, I, I will say that I have a dot phrase, a smart phrase in my epic notes that go into the patient instructions as to when to call, how to monitor their weight, um, if they're getting more short of breath. And I talk to my nurses as well. If, if someone on an IDH inhibitor calls them with shortness of breath, uh, yeah, most leukemia patients, that means you could set them up for a transfusion in a couple of days. The IDH inhibitor patient, we need to see. And so there is a lot of education there. Um, I want to move on to our last topic. So before I get there, I want to mention a couple of other important toxicities that we do manage with the IDH inhibitors. Hyperbilirubinemia is seen with um, anacitinib. Quite frankly, um, uh, I typically don't do dose adjustments um, because of uh, hyperbilirubinemia from inhibition of UGT1A1. But it's a, Harry, it's a measure of patient compliance. It had better yes. be up. <laughs> right, exactly. And, but Very it's good a point. mistake to stop the therapy. And I think that's, you know, you want to get that in your, in your smart phrase, which by the way, please send me because that'll save me a lot of work. But I think that, I think that at that point also, you don't want to stop the effective therapy for an irrelevant uh, bilirubin value. I, I want to see it, yeah. Yeah, QT prolongation has been associated with ibocytinib and then um, not many people know this, but be, in our phase one experience, uh, you all may remember Guillain-Barre in two out of about 200 I had patients. a case. I had a case. 